Okay, the next topic we're going to look at is functional anatomy. And we'll start with the division between the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. So here's a diagram illustrating the upper respiratory tract. And the point at which the upper respiratory tract ends and the lower respiratory tract starts is right here at the level of the vocal cords. Above here is upper respiratory tract, below there is lower respiratory tract. That's a very important division between the upper and lower respiratory tract. Above there, everything is absolutely filthy. And below there, it's fairly clean. It used to be thought to be sterile, but there's certain bacteria which live in the lower respiratory tract. It's not thought it's not sterile, but it's certainly a whole lot cleaner than everything up here. That's really important in the ABCs of emergency medicine. A is airway. So the first thing you do when you find a patient with a lowered level of consciousness is protect the airway, which usually means put an ET tube or some kind of airway down into the trachea. So you've got a protected clean route for air to get down that's protecting all the dirty stuff here or vomit that comes up from getting down into the lower respiratory tract. Because if dirty stuff gets down there, you're going to be a whole lot worse off than you were before it got down there. All right, so what do we do in the upper respiratory tract? There's functions of this upper respiratory tract. First one is it conditions air. So if you look in this unfortunate cross section here, you can see that in the nasal cavity, there are folds of mucous tissue. These are called conchi and turbinates. The conchi is the space between the turbinates, the thing hanging down. So that means when you're breathing in through your nose, your air is brushing up and very turbulent throw th flow through there, getting humidified and uh, getting all the dust particles filtered out. The other thing is you get amplification of sound. So you see the sinuses next to the nasal, nasal, the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. So when we speak, if we, um, if we didn't have these sinuses and this, this sort of large structure up here, the sound that we make would be a, a very um, unpleasant sound. Like it's like blowing through a winded, like a clarinet mouthpiece without the clarinet attached to it. It's a very squawky type of sound, I think. I've never actually heard anybody talk who's had their head cut off, but I think it would sound like that. Um, it also controls air, air and fluid flow. So you've got musculature, which makes sure when you swallow, the fluid goes down into the esophagus, which is back there. And when you breathe, the air goes there. And it provides barriers to pressure. So I can close my epiglottis down here, and I can build up a lot of pressure in my trachea, and I can release it suddenly. That's very important in coughing and sneezing, and the sort of more delicate controlling of building pressures and releasing pressures is very important in speech. Okay, we'll now go down below the vocal cord to the lower respiratory tract. So when you get down there, it is a very complicated tracheobronchial tree. It's not that complicated. You have a trachea, which gives rise to two airways, the left and right mainstem bronchi. And they give rise to two airways, and then they give rise. So it's called a dichotomous airway. It keeps branching by the mother airway, giving rise to two daughter airways. They're called daughter airways. They could be called son airways. I don't know why. Um, so as you go down, they get named. There's the trachea, the main bronchi, the segmental bronchi. Then when you get down to the bronchioles, there's quite a lot of divisions are grouped together and called the bronchioles. Then it changes to respiratory bronchioles. And that's, that's a very important division. Everything above there, above 15, is just conducting air down to the place where you need gas exchange. Everything below there is where gas exchange starts to take place. And that happens at what we call the alveoli. So in generation 15, the airways start to get lined with alveoli. So we call that upper region, where you're just taking air down to the place where you need to have it for gas exchange. It's called dead space, and you really, you'll read about dead space in some of the patients you read about. It's not dead, it's completely alive, it's just that you don't have gas exchange taking place. Um, so what else happens? On the way down, you've got structural support keeping the, so starting here, the zero generation, so that's the trachea, moving all the way down, gas exchange starting there, all the way down to the 23rd generation. 
So you can see up high up the structural support is cartilage tissue. Look up here, there's a lot of cartilage surrounding the airways. So cartilaginous tissue is keeping the airways open. You've got a lot of conditioning of the air. So even though the air has passed the vocal cords, it still needs to be conditioned, it needs to be warmed, it needs to be humidified. And hopefully that's all happened by the time you get down to the delicate alveoli at generation 15. You've got protection from the immune system the whole way down. Um, you've got macrophages and neutrophils down in your alveoli, cleaning up anything that does happen to get down there. And obviously a lot more protection higher up. Gas exchange, as I already mentioned, only starts once you get down to generation 15, and then progressively increases as you get further down. This diagram here is actually important for a lot of diseases. It shows the total cross-sectional area. So that's the size of the hole inside the airway. So up at this point, up at generation zero, that's the trachea. You've got about two square centimeters, two centimeters squared, or two square centimeters of cross-sectional area. As you move down to the left and right main stem bronchi, that gets a little bit less. So that those two cross-sectional areas add to a little bit less. But then as you keep moving down, even though you've got smaller and smaller airways, there's so many of them because of that doubling each time you move down, that the total cross-sectional area of each generation gets bigger and bigger and bigger. With diseases, that can change. So when you look at these diseases like asthma, chronic obstructive lung disease, these airways here start to get narrow, so that curve gets flattened. All right, to get the air in and out, you need muscles of breathing. There's inspiratory muscles and expiratory muscles. We'll learn soon that you guys sitting there at rest are mainly using inspiratory muscles. So you're breathing in, and then when you relax, the air flows out again. The principal muscles, that means the ones you're using right now, are the external intercostals and the diaphragm, which is hidden behind there. So you're breathing in with those muscles, relaxing to breathe out. There's accessory muscles. These can help you breathe in. The sternocleidomastoid and the scalenes, these are in the neck. That's incredibly useful because when you go in, particularly in a child, so if you see a child where every time they're breathing, you can see these muscles contracting. You won't be able to actually see the muscle, but you see it under the skin. You'll see it sort of tightening as they breathe in. If they're doing that, then you know they're working harder to breathe in than a healthy person would. So looking at the neck, particularly in a child, will tell you whether they're working harder to breathe or not. The other muscles that you don't normally use are the expiratory muscles, the muscles that help you breathe out. Again, um, if you see somebody who's clearly using their abdominal muscles, because these are the main expiratory muscles, the, the muscles lining the abdomen, when they contract, they help force air out of the lung. So if you see that somebody's using these muscles every time they breathe out, they're having to work harder to breathe than a healthy person would be. So it's very useful to, when you're examining patients, to look at the muscles and how they're using them. Spirometry, spirometric measurement. I think you've probably already seen spirometry in some of the patients you've looked at in some of the first problems. So spirometer was invented by this guy, a guy called John Hutchinson, early 1800s. He was an English physician. He used this device where when you breathe into it, a bell moved up and down and made a tracing on a piece of carbon, carbon coated paper. And the tracing looks like this. So when you breathe in, your lung volume goes up. And when you breathe out, your lung volume comes back down. Breathe in, breathe out. That regular breathing cycle that you're doing right now at rest, the amount you're breathing in and out with each breath is called your tidal volume. You can see at the end of an inspiration, you could, if you wanted, go up a whole lot further. And you could breathe all the way in to what's called total lung capacity. That's your full lung. So there's an inspiratory reserve volume. At the end of a breath, you can breathe out further. You can breathe down to a volume called residual volume. So you can never empty your lungs. If you emptied your lungs, then all the wet surfaces would come together, become very hard to breathe in again. So there's mechanisms that prevent you from breathing all the way out. And you can see everything has a name. So the tidal volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, the expiratory reserve volume, the residual volume, Functional residual capacity is how much you breathe in, sorry, where you are at the end of a normal expiration. And then the vital capacity is how much you can breathe in and out 
voluntarily. So these volumes are all named by uh, Dr. Hutchinson. He actually didn't pursue medicine. He ended up going and working for a company where they made use of this device. And what he found was that this volume, the vital capacity, was very predictive of when somebody was going to die. So no matter what disease you had, why you were sick, the lower your vital capacity, the closer you were to dying. And that's why it's called vital capacity. And the company, the industry that he went and worked for was the insurance industry because he found a tool that could predict when people were going to die. 